Hey people, thank you for stopping by Building Wealth with Rajiv. I talked to Ahmed Pepper. Many of the people who are active in Tesla community would know Ahmed Pepper. Very successful investor who made huge significant gains on Tesla and then started a hedge fund. Ahmed and we talk about various things and all things Tesla mostly. What's the future of Tesla? What's the future of BART? What's the future of autonomous driving? Where does Tesla go in 2030? Best case scenario, worst case scenario, base case scenarios. Please follow my channel for such meaningful discussions. I'm at Spotify, Google, and Apple as well. Okay, so so let's let's go back a year and a sure. half ago when we talked. I think Tesla's story was was great to you, and it you know a lot has changed in a in a year and a half. And I'm not yes. sure whether you even remember what we talked because it's so long. But how things have changed, you know, that time no competition was there. I read just BYD, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, coming out with the, the huge number of electric vehicles. What has changed? Do you think anything changed? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Tesla, I mean, the markets have changed a lot, obviously, and growth stocks have uh, totally fallen out of favor. Um, and Tesla was a member of that, you know, growth stock category for so long. Um, but now we're kind of seeing a historic uh, changeover where Tesla is becoming uh, a, more of a, a value stock. I think it's got a, a better forward PE than Amazon at the moment, which is incredible, you know? And so in the last year and a half, um, while all the growth uh, tech software stocks have, you know, lost 70, 80, 90% value in some cases, Tesla, you know, it's close to it's, you know, it's not far from its historic high. I think it's only like 10 or 20% down, 20% down or so from its historic high as we're recording this, you know, um, you know, $915 pre-split adjusted. So it's like around $306 at the moment, but yeah. So Tesla is holding up its, uh, its stock price. And, and that's what I believe in. And Tesla is kind of an anomaly. Um, and, uh, but the, the market, the macro market has been hit hard and interest rates are going up and, um, we don't really know where it's going from here, but it's, uh, it's a def definitely a different climate, investing climate versus 18 months ago. And what's, what's I think, specifically, uh, so Tesla holding up in this crisis time, was that a surprise to you, Amit, or were you kind of a, you thought that it's it's kind of a, you know, knowing the company in and out? Yeah. Okay with that. No, I mean, if I look back, this is about what I would expect. You know, if, if the whole macro market was kind of crashing, especially a big hit to growth in tech stocks, I'd expect Tesla to take a hit with it. I thought Tesla's hit might have been worse and gone down to like, you know, a 400 billion market cap or something like that temporarily. And then bouncing back as a couple quarters showed strong growth, you know, the last couple quarters. But I think it only got down as low as like, very temporary, like 600, five or between five and $600 billion market cap, you know, pre I, I, the pre-split adjusted price is easier for me to, to gauge yes, that yes, because it was yes. closely in line, like five or $600. It was in that range temporarily, very shortly. And then it bounced right back up. And the earnings reports the last couple of quarters have been phenomenal. And then we're on the eve of the third quarter earnings report, which my partner, Matt and I believe will be very strong. And so further bolster, we think the floor of Tesla. So every time the earnings reports get gets more shows better gross margins or earning capabilities, operating margins, um, then we think the floor of Tesla's valuation is rises. You know, and so even despite the growth stocks all coming down, you have a floor of Tesla which is coming up higher and higher. So maybe the floor of Tesla in my mind is you know. 800 billion at the moment or something like that. Even if the growth stocks take another big leg blower with the Fed raising rates 100 basis points instead of 75, two times in a row or something, whatever could cause the growth stocks to get much worse, for example. But just to pause here for one second, everything we talk about is not investment advice. I'm yeah, not yeah, a registered yeah. investment advisor. I, I run a hedge fund, but I am not an investment advisor registered. No. And this is all just our opinion, my opinion of talking. It's just personal opinion. This, yeah, this. I'm not talking on behalf of the hedge fund decisions yeah, or anything, yeah, just yeah, personal yeah. decision making, yeah. their opinions. Anyway, yeah. sorry right. to change. I just forgot to mention no, that at the beginning. No, no, it's, it's, it's all good, Amit. And you know what? You, you remain even more bullish, isn't it? I mean, competitive landscape, what's that? I mean, uh, you know, I, one of the companies went bankrupt, right? I mean, I, I don't remember what was the name. And I, I, the Lucid posted some very stupid results. Yeah. I think Rivian, Rivian is okay. And like Lucid was all, Lucid is next big thing, but it's fuck all, right? 
Yeah. And BYD is coming out with numbers where they seem to produce higher, uh, you know, uh, numbers of electric vehicles. But what's the comparative landscape according to you for Tesla? I think it's the product that Tesla produces. Um, I think there's some Chinese EV players in China that are competitive as on a product level, like to some degree, like um, Xiaopeng and um, Neo and Li Automotive, and maybe there's a few others. I don't put BYD in that category. BYD, I put in like the legacy automaker category, but for electric vehicle drivetrains, like I don't think their product is very special. I don't think people like, you know, talk about that brand as like a special product. You know, I think it's just kind of got a ton of supply and that it can push and they push it at like very low margins typically. And I think a lot of BYD's vehicles are just like plug-in hybrids to be honest. I, I, I don't think they're pure EV play, pure EVs to be honest. So I know they're, you know, they're, they're in the right um, ocean of EVs being, becoming a bigger thing in the future, but I don't think they're um, in the same pool as Tesla and the other EV players in China. And I think in the US, there's no competition for Tesla. I think you have the Ford Mach-E or the Ford Electric Lightning, you know, and, and I think Ford loses money on all those cars. You know, they're producing them, selling a limited amount, but they're losing money on them. They're trying to figure out how to make them profitably. You know, Ford doesn't really lay it out, um, but that's my suspicion. Um, and I don't think for that reason, I don't think Ford can really afford to <laughs> ramp up the, the, the quantity at this point. Um, and so Tesla is just, it's, it's, it's Tesla's game to win in the U S and, and Europe, um, there's a little more competition with Volkswagen, but I still think the product in Europe, Tesla by far is the best product in Europe too. And so Tesla, as many cars as they can make, they'll be able to sell still for years to come. Um, despite a global recession uh, going on. And, you know, worst case, um, the full self-driving FSD, you know, software, I think that's what really differentiates Tesla to another level, even within China. Like, I don't think Chinese EVs, they have some, they're trying to do, you know, full self-driving. They're trying to do their own version of self-driving, but it's probably stuck in a similar rut that Waymo or Cruise is in the US and geofenced and not quite as safe. Whereas Tesla's unique philosophical approach to FSD based on gathering data and using neural networks, that's going to solve general full self-driving in my mind, in my opinion. And I don't think anyone else is close to them in that. So what's the, what's the, what's the catalyst playing out for, you know, uh, you know, you appear on Dave's channel, right? And I follow Dave, what an amazing uh, YouTuber. Dave he's, Lee. He's, he yeah. Talked to, he's yeah, he, yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. He talked about S curves, right? Uh, Tesla mm -hmm. S curves and he divided what, what's what's going through your mind on this climate? Uh, we have EVs, right? They have a great product in EV. Uh, it's more than an EV company for you, isn't it? Yeah, way more than an EV company. For a while, it was an EV company for me from, you know, when I started looking at it in 2010 or 2011 and up until 2000. 14 or 15, I just thought of them as an EV only company. Then, then Elon started recruiting and talking publicly on Twitter about developing um, autonomous driving capabilities and software. And so then I started thinking of more of a tech software company potential. And more recently, they he's talking about the bot, you know, and there's energy and there's a lot of different pieces of, of Tesla now. It's a conglomerate of businesses, insurance, you know, solar roofs. Um, but you have to keep in mind, Tesla is now a one trillion market cap company, eff effectively. You know, so one trillion is huge. It's a mega cap, right? And so mm -hmm. all these other conglomerates that are part of Tesla, you know, three years ago when Tesla was a fifty billion dollar market cap company, then I still saw the budding of a lot of these things. Not the Tesla bot, but like the solar roof and like the energy and you know, insurance wasn't really a, a speculation and yet that at that point, but there was still a lot of conglomerates to get excited about because you're like, wow, each of these could be its own 30 or $50 billion market cap business. You added on, it was exciting, you know? And now all these conglomerates, I still think could each be like a 30, 50, maybe a hundred billion market cap in the case of insurance, if it goes really well or something, but it's not going to double the market cap from 1 trillion to 2 trillion in my mind, you know, the things that will double or add multiples of market cap at this point from 1 trillion on is the FSD, the full self-driving, you know, turning Tesla, letting Tesla become a robo taxi business or company or product, like revolutionizing that. That's huge. That could be multi-trillion dollar market cap potential. And then Tesla bot, which we're just 
beginning to learn more about, you know, Elon's alluded to that being even bigger of an opportunity for a total addressable market than FSD. So that's super exciting. I'm very excited for this AI day part two coming up in a few weeks. We're in a week or a couple of weeks, yeah, whatever, I, you know, that's going to be really neat. Yeah. I was about to ask you on that. What, what are you, what are you looking for in AI day? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I definitely think we'll see a demo of the bot. Um, I think uh, years, a, a year and a half ago when they were talking about AI day, the first one, and I was like, wouldn't it be so cool if they had like an autonomous Tesla car drive up and, and it was, and a, a humanoid robot got out of the car and it was like driving the car. <laughs> That'd be so cool. Like I would think that would be the ultimate, like attention getter because he's trying to attract talent. And I think that's the primary purpose of this is more, not just to get an exciting investors. Like they don't need to excite me as an investor. You know, they, it's fun. I love getting more excited about the future of potential, but Tesla stock is so big at this point and self-sufficient, they don't need to raise capital anymore. So it's really mo mostly to attract talent and like young engineering students that are like super talented at prestigious schools, getting ready mm -hmm. to start their career and hungry. And so I think those people, Elon needs to pitch them on why Tesla is the number one place to go to still. And it already is number one, but make it even more number one. Keep the talent rolling in at Tesla. And I think to get them super excited, you got to do something fantastical, but realistic, you know, something that mm. and present a future that is good, that has a path, come work at Tesla and you could be part of that future. And so maybe having a, a robo taxi Tesla drive up with a humanoid robot getting out to deliver a last foot delivery package would be super cool. And then someone interacting with a rope or maybe someone interacting with the robot, talking to the robot, like, uh, you know, we really need like three CPO in Star Wars or something. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I feel like he's got it. He's going to show some kind of really neat demo um, to get people excited. So are you going there? No, I, well, I don't know. It's to be determined. I mean, I think uh, there'll probably be some kind of, I would hope there's some kind of drawing or something. Um, and I would certainly enter it, but uh, you know, I don't, I, you know, I'll watch it live if I'm not there. So, okay, for sure. I, I think let's just uh, go a little bit deeper into numbers. Not that deep, but still. A, uh, let, let's talk about bot because this is the most exciting stuff, right? And a lot mm -hmm. of people underestimate it. Uh, a lot of people think it's a fad, right? I mean, and yeah. that's, that's the beauty. That it's an investment yeah. opportunity for a savvy investor, right? Now, yeah. what, what do you think the financial implications of that for Tesla? Uh, I mean, the financial implications are... Um, this bot is going to create an age of abundance for Tesla. Like it's going to revolutionize our economy. And that's what Elon's kind of talked about. And like the market cap of Tesla as a stock, instead of, it could be tens of trillions of dollars, you know, um, within a decade or so, if this bot is very successful. So that's the impact on the Tesla stock, I'd say. Um, now there's a lot of, things that have to come true for this bot. Like, you know, you have to um, make it cost effectively. Tesla has to be kind of an innovate. It is an innovator, but it has to have some real differentiation versus the other people that are going to be trying to copy it. And so that's why I think you got to get the best talent. You know, um, Elon has been a very successful product architect, uh, architect up till now to make the best product. So I don't see why that won't continue. Um, and I think, you know, it's hard to put the numbers in terms of like, how much billions in annual profit or whatnot. And is Tesla going to sell the bot and let you do with, with it what you want? Or is it going to lease the bot out to people? And is it going to have like an app store? They're going to be a bunch of third-party developers creating functions the bots can download and do like mow my lawn or pick up the garbage in the rain or things that humans don't want to do. You know, there'll be all kinds of like endless possibilities that can come along with this, like take care of my grandmother, you know, all kinds of things, endless possibilities. It's very exciting. So I don't know <laughs> what the, t the end is for Tesla, but it's going to be a very rich and favorable future for future for Tesla, I believe. And the, the world. Bot. And the world, yeah. yeah, and the world. And the bots will make themselves. Initially, in the beginning, they'll be in the factory, doing factory generic tasks, probably. Um, but... And then, you know, they'll be used for limited other cases, limited cases, but eventually you can see a future where the bots are making other bots. And then you have, you know, it's crazy. I, I think you send space. I think there's a, 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 
a play with SpaceX where, you know, SpaceX is trying to colonize Mars. You send, instead of sending humans, you just send thousands and thousands of these bots to, to Mars with like a couple of human engineers that go to help do things locally on Mars to the bots to fix them or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. coordinate them that needs to be. But for the most part, you don't need thousands of humans to kickstart a civilization on Mars. You need thousands of bots and then the humans can arrive. You know, the bots build the homes, get everything ready, and then humans can arrive and, and other... Oh, other uh, I'm watching a science fiction right now, but it seems like created a picture in front of me, these bots going to Mars and doing all these yeah. things. And yeah. this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the autonomous driving, is it coming to your expectations? I mean, I know you, be, you must have been driving <clears throat> at a very close yeah. point. Is it I've going been using away, it. do you think? Yeah. I think it's 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 a technological marvel. It's it's incredible the way it's functioning. I drive with it every day. Um, if I'm in a hurry to go somewhere, I don't use it because it's pretty patient and safe, you know. But like a lot of times, I'm in the hurry to get to somewhere by this time, and I have to like just take over to get in the left lane to go faster, you know, that kind of stuff. But if I'm not in a hurry, which is probably half the time, I I let it do its thing, and I watch it, and it's amazing and it's relaxing. I can just kind of daydream or whatever where the car is driving very rarely do i have to intervene i have a lot of zero intervention drives i think the unprotected left turn is still an issue like i don't know if they need to solve that for dangerous left turns to be honest like that i don't know everyone talks about this chuck cook style left turn and it supposedly solved this particular left unprotected left turn which is very in my mind i wouldn't even do that as a human driver i'd make a right and then figure out a place to make a u-turn or make a left later and then come out of a parking lot and make another right to go the way i wanted to go so i don't think it necessarily needs to solve that but i think it was a good kind of test case to see can they figure out a way to solve it and they did for chuck particular left turn but then there's other unprotected lefts that are a little bit nuanced like i have one that's not nearly as serious coming out of my neighborhood and it seems to get that wrong a lot or just makes it uncomfortable um because it, it's trying to make sure the the, the it, it pulls out in a way that forces the person coming from the right to slow down and a human wouldn't necessarily do that so there's certain uncomfortable things with the fsd beta they have to work on to make it more human like instead of you know it might be safe like i think they've solved the safety part of it to a large degree but they have to solve the comfort part now and so to make it not drive like a jerk is what i'm saying like right now it drives like a jerk in a lot of cases like when you go to a stop sign and you wait excessively long for the other cars to make sure they know it's your turn and they're all like come on go or you just slowly make a right coming out of a stop sign. The car behind you is like, what are you doing? Just go. It's all coast is clear. Why are you going so slow and hesitating? You know, so there's certain things that it, it, it just drives kind of like a jerk. Like if you were driving and that person was in front of you, you'd be like pocking the horn, like, come on, go. What are you doing? You know? And I think as a, me as an occupant in this car, I'm conscious of that. And I don't necessarily want all the other people to be annoyed at me. So I'm like, it's a little uncomfortable. So once they get past that and drive more like a human, um, I think you'll get a wider adoption, but right now it drives like a jerk. Like it forces the person to slow down when I make a left in front of them on the unprotected left turn, you know, and yeah, that's not going to be an accident 99.9999% of the time, but probably 90% of the time, the person that has to slow down is annoyed and has to like, he's like, why is this person making this left in front of me? I'm going 50 miles an hour. Doesn't he know that I'm there, you know, and, and he made mm -hmm. a left now to slow down at 30 miles an hour to, to, so, or change lanes, you know? So there's just like, Little things like that that kind of I think need to be worked on. I think that's where I think the, the data part comes in, right? More data they get uh, on this, and better they become. Yeah, yeah. The more data, I mean, they've got a lot of data on those those types of turns. So I'm not sure, to be honest, about the data on that type of turn. Okay. Uh, you know, on that type of like those type of extra safe. You know, and from a safety score, or safety bag of points point of view it's probably super safe and that's what they care about most right now but then they need to tweak it to be more comfortable they need to have like a comfortability bag of points or something a human comfort level bag of points i've heard them talk about for the neural network to work on to be more like a human so that it's not upsetting any other drivers around them you know what i mean so are you are you into that uh, ideology of kathy wood where she talks about robotaxis are you thinking that's reality 
Yeah, I mean, the robo taxis, um, that's a model that ARK Invest has famously uh, put together, and they have kind of like Monte Carlo uh, simulations uh, simulations, and put forth. And I know my partner, Matt, has uh, looked at that, and he's done his own kind of modeling. And we don't factor that into our expectations at this time of Tesla. We still think even if FSD doesn't come to fruition in the next few years or anytime ever, perhaps, and just stays at level two, like super awesome level two, for example. We still think Tesla is a wildly, incredibly valued company that's going to continue to grow. But um, yeah, the robotaxi economy is is going to disrupt a lot of things, I think. Yeah, I mean, who wouldn't want to initially, it's going to be a couple of years, I think, at least from the, when the wide scale adoption of the FSD comes out to when like legally it's allowed to let the cars drive like everywhere without a human in the car. I think that's going to be like a couple, maybe a couple of years window of time for that to kind of get to that stage. But in the meantime, in that couple, couple of years, who wouldn't want to be an Uber or DoorDash driver that you know, has the Tesla drive itself and you're just sitting there, you know, and you're comfortable and you can like listen to your podcast, listen to R R Rajiv here and me talk. <laughs> much, yeah. yeah. Without <laughs> us, without having to even think about which turn you make or whatever, you know, and very once in a while, you know, maybe you have to intervene if need be, but for the most part, you're just, be, you're just being paid to sit in that front seat um, and let the car drive itself. Yeah. And so, I think I would one thing not, not, you talked about the catalyst, right? And now I, I put this catalyst in one bucket and then I try to see what picture emerges out of the or for Tesla, let's say in five years or six years down the line. Again, not as a hedge fund player, but as somebody, an investor, passionate uh, bull and a close watcher of Tesla, what, what are you thinking? Where does Tesla go from here? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, I'm not talking about price targets here. They, they can be very confusing when I'm talking about how big the company could be. Yeah, it's going to be the biggest company in the world, for sure, in my mind, by the end of the decade, even if FSD doesn't come to fruition. But if FSD comes to fruition, it'll happen much sooner. And every institutional investment manager is going to have to have a view and be comfortable talking about their view on what they think of Tesla, just like they do now for Apple, for example, or Microsoft. Or, you know, it's, it's, I can't believe there's so many institutional managers that seem to be afraid to talk about Tesla right now still. I think because they're just unsure. They've been like dumbfounded that Tesla has risen to like a trillion dollar market cap company when they've been fed all this information from people they normally trust that Tesla's overvalued and gonna go to zero, go bankrupt. And suddenly that defied everything and now Tesla's at a trillion market cap. So I think all these institutional managers, whether they're in financial media or just amongst themselves, they're sort of like up in the, it's, Tesla is such a complicated, not complicated, but just it's a huge, conglomerate of businesses and it's disrupting, of startups yeah, I think yeah and it's startups. disrupting the auto industry and software industry and it's disrupting so many things in different ways that's never been seen before you know it's vertically integrated doesn't use dealership networks they you know design their own chips now they're building out their own fsd so you know there's just they're doing so many things they're building a bot now like how crazy is that a left field you know <laughs> and so you know, everything they do, other people start trying to copy too. And um, it's just, I don't think people know how, unless you really commit to studying Tesla, like yeah, a significant yeah. amount, yeah. you can't and, understand and the vision. it. And yeah. The and vision. the vision, you won't have the capability to understand it, you know, mm -hmm. like, and, and so you should not be presenting a view, but then you look like an idiot if you're not presenting a view on what the most valuable company in the world is. So they're all going to be forced to really study and understand it. And they're going to regurgitate, regurgitate points from other people they trust and sometimes look stupid mm -hmm. or whatever. But I think you'll have more and more institutional managers, more comfortable talking about Tesla and, and what it's growing into um, as the fundamentals continue to improve where value stock pickers, you know, start looking at Tesla as well. They were, I, I was quite, I was quite angry when I read about the credit rating agencies, Emmett, you know, Moody's yeah. and, you know, I was so, so upset with that. And, you know, yeah. I've been talking to Alex who, who chased all the credit rating agency, you know, she was chasing Moody. I don't know whether you've seen Alex tweets or not, yeah. asking about what, what the hell are they up to? But what, what was your reaction to that? Yeah, there's, these are like dinosaur Wall Street institutions you know um they they really they they need to be disrupted you know they're, they're just kind of like these old systems of 
people that, you know, organizations that work in, in a way that they were, you know, for, for maybe it was like done well in the eighties and nineties, but now we're in a different world. And there's, there's, there's um, with Tesla, Tesla doesn't play by the same, it doesn't operate the same way. Um, and it doesn't like, take the Moody's and S&P people out to dinner or like pay for their services the way other companies do. And I think that, you know, that loses, they lose brownie points with Moody's and S&P because of that. And so Moody's and S&P puts them in the penalty box and like, all right, we're not going to look at your, we're not going to look at you the same way or give you as much attention looking at you or whatever, whatever it is behind the scenes, there's, there's things going on that causes Moody's and S&P not to feel like they need to be proactive on Tesla. You know, they can, they can lay back, sit back. And now they're looking dumb for sitting back too long. First, it looked bad for including them in the index, you know, plus you have a number of institutional managers who have all this time been mm. fear mongering Tesla in the ear of the S and P analysts and the Moody's analysts about mm. why Tesla is worth nothing, or she's going to go bankrupt and you'd be embarrassed to upgrade them, you know? And so that, has been in their ear all this time. And same with the S and P committee that decides on who to include or not. That was in there, you know, so it leads to just a much later than it should have been um, inclusion of whether the S and P inclusion or now the ratings upgrades, it'll happen, but it'll be later than it should have been. Um, and that's, that's fine. I was a Tesla investor. I'm used to that kind of, uh, you know, underdog. Um, it's almost, you know, it's, it's almost rally, it rallies. I feel like Tesla investors, this kind of underdog mentality we have to go through. And, you know, it's, 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 a, it's so surprising, right? No company with a trillion worth of market cap gets so much of a polarized view and disrespect, I would say, uh, from the yeah, institutions. Disrespect. And yeah. I mean, Elon is not loved by these people. Sometimes, you know, he's, he's hated by these people. I, I can't understand the reason for that, though. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, See, uh, on, on the on the front, you know, you talked about the dinosaurs, the Wall Street, uh, Emma. Just just quickly, you run a hedge fund too, right? Yes, and, a small uh, fund I have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a small fund, and you know, obviously it's new, so obviously it's it's going to be small. It's going to be very big in future, I'm sure. What's, uh, <laughs> maybe, what's, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. But you know, uh, yeah. you have a track record. So, so what what's what what are you trying to achieve in that? And what 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 is your strategy? How do you pick the companies? Yeah. So the fund is sort of my vehicle for my own kind of aggressive, risky investment trading philosophy. Um, and so <clears throat> for years, I had a bucket of personal wealth. I traded in that way and I kept it kind of separate and it did incredibly well where I was able to leave my job and, you know, just I could set aside. So instead of, so basically I left my job and I have a pool of wealth that I, you know, have a conservative on. I hold like just Tesla stock and maybe some um, other, you know, value stocks and another strategy for in case, you know, my growth test Tesla is wrong or whatever. So I just have a conservative pool of money, but then I have my risky, I want to continue doing and, you know, working on my own investment philosophy of finding disruptive companies and using options in ways that could be incredible returns if I'm right and such. And so this pool of capital, I, I created a hedge fund and I said, okay, other people can join me in this if they want to participate and put their money in the pool and I'll continue this investment philosophy and we'll all share the returns together. And so I have a number of investors that have come on and I have a partner I took on, Matt Smith. He's incredible. And Tesla's our highest conviction name for sure, still is. And we don't just own Tesla stock, you know, because investors aren't paying us just to own stock. You know, this is a very risky investment um, uh, strategy. And it's a 506C fund, which is different than most hedge funds. So we can market our return to the public. Uh, we just have to do extra checks on the background if they apply to become an investor and so forth. But unlike most hedge funds, we can actually talk about our performance or show it on our website, goodsoilinvestment.com is our website. People can go on there and look at performance or our, our latest investment thesis. Um, and it hasn't done so well so far in 2022 because growth stocks have been hit. But we don't just hold stock. We hold a lot of options. We do a lot of options. We look for things that we think could be a five or 10 X return. Even if we only think it's a 20 or 25% chance that it happens, 
Um, we would take that bet a lot of times if we think it could be a 10 X return, if that 25% chance is right, because then, you know, if we're wrong, it turns to zero, that 20, the amount of capital in that particular investment opportunity. But if we're right, we get a 10 X return on what we think was a 25%. So that if you, if you do the math on that overall, and you do that over and over, it's going to be a really good return over a long enough time horizon. And so that's kind of the mentality we have in a lot of ways. And sometimes these opportunities are only like a one month window. Sometimes they're a six month or two year window. Um, and so we use options a lot of times and time will tell whether uh, we are a good judge of this 25% or 20% or 30%, whatever we think is our own probability of this thing happening that could result in a 10 X or more return. Time will tell whether we're, we're a good judge on that or not. Uh, we just needed to do that enough times to have kind of a, an average, it average out or regress to a mean where my return is either, our return is either really good or maybe our return is not so good. So we're kind of in the midst of that, figuring that out. And this macro market um, crash has been a bit big hiccup. But another unique thing we're doing with the fund, so I'm going on a while. The other big part of the fund, which is more important to Matt and I than actually just getting great returns, is that <clears throat> we have kind of a unique fee structure in the fund. Did I, did I tell you about this last time, Rajiv, or did we talk about this, the fee structure of our fund? No, no. I, I think you talked about it, but uh, it was, uh, no, 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 no. I don't know. I, I don't know. Okay. I yeah. So I set up the fund in, in a way where I, we wrote in the offering memorandum that 50% of the fees, both the management and performance fees. So 50% of those fees, net of expenses goes to charity. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so it's a little different because most hedge fund, there's lots of billion dollar hedge funds that give to charity through like hedge fund cares or other events. And they give very like opportunistically, like a hedge fund might give $100,000 to some organization, get a name of a, they might get their own parking spot at the San Francisco Giants stadium or something as a result. But then also that $100,000 they give you find out is only like 0.01% of the money they made, you know, because it's a multi-billion dollar fund, you know? So we're trying to be more, um, we're, we're trying to bring a more active giving model, giving back model to the most successful people in capitalism, which arguably could be hedge fund managers, you could say, you know, hedge fund managers, the most successful ones are very, very wealthy people. Some of the most yeah. wealthy people in the world, yeah. you know? And so maybe to be more proactive about giving back and more public about it, could help the perception of capitalism in general in our minds, mm. which is under fire a lot lately from younger people being kind of indoctrinated in schools to look at socialism or Marxism as like the solution, you know, which I think would be a disaster for society if we tried to elect a Bernie Sanders and his whole contingent of <laughs> politicians in one election cycle. I think that would be the end of, uh, of, 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 our culture um, as we know it, uh, the beginning of the end. So to, to try to cast a better light on capitalism and how it can evolve, I think giving back could be a big role. And why not try to disrupt the hedge fund industry to say, hey, why don't you write in your prospectus to, that you give back 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 percent of your fees to charity if you succeed? Um, and then you could be public about what you're giving to or whatnot. And it would just be a much better perception on the people that hate billionaires when they see more giving back, you know? So I'm, um, you know, I, I think it's, a, it, that's what keeps my partner, Matt and I going on running the hedge fund. We have more than enough. I have more than enough money than me and my family need. It wasn't so appetizing to start a hedge fund after I did so well, but then I thought of this idea and that kept me, got lit a fire under me where I was like, you know, I, I should start the hedge fund and I'll do this. And maybe if it succeeds, I can be a part of helping out, the world what i think is helping yeah, this, out the world this phenomenal and i think you donated some money to the afghanistan cause also right dave lee was uh, yeah 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 he, he talks yeah. about you on the channel and uh, yeah i donated you personally uh, you more personally. donation yeah on a more of a personal from my foundations that we don't but the hedge fund is also donating we on our our own youtube channel you inspired me rajiv to start our own youtube channel from our last channel like, you know rajiv's doing this i could do it so we have our own oil investment YouTube channel where we try to open source our research. And also ARK Investment inspires me with their open source research. Mm. And so we're like, all right, we're going to 
my partner Matt and I were going to interview interesting people in the Tesla community, but just other things too that we follow. We like Roblox, Rocket Lab, and Lemonade mm. Insurance as an insure tech play. Those are three other companies we talk publicly about. So we those themes, Roblox, like the metaverse, kind of metaverse, e-gaming or online, you know, the future of that. And Rocket Lab is like second place in the space industry to SpaceX, we believe. And um, so we talk about those industries and we and invite what we think are like thought leaders on those industries or other things that are important. And then at the end of our discussion, we say, okay, what charity did you pick? And we'll donate five or $10,000 to that charity. And oh, wow. so we've been doing that and, and we make that the last five or 10 minutes of the discussion and then talking about that charity. So we include it in the content generation model we're building out too. That's amazing. And so besides Tesla, you said you have Robolex, you have Roblox, yeah, yeah, Roblox. The 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 it's it's a it's a, the, the children gaming. Uh, platform. Yeah, it's actually the demographic is is evolving to be mm. uh, more seventeen and over. But yeah, it's most known for being you know under seventeen or under twelve year you know eight to twelve five to twelve year olds. But you know their their demographics are certainly evolving, and that's. But surprise on your lemonade though. You are still on lemonade. Lemonade insurance, yeah. I think um, from an insurance perspective, uh, they have a real chance to disrupt the. And it, it's a completely different animal than Tesla. Tesla's a trillion dollar market cap. Lemonade's a one billion market cap, one point five billion market cap, right? So that's like one one thousandth the size of Tesla. You know, so it's a very different mindset you have to be in when you think about lemonade versus like Tesla. People are like, oh, wasn't Tesla insurance going to just ruin lemonade? I'm like, well, listen, if Tesla insurance spun out on its own, it'd probably be worth like $50 billion right now, just the possibilities of what Tesla can do with that, right? Lemonade's 1.5 billion market cap, right? <laughs> you know, So like if lemonade succeeds to some degree, I think if it becomes profitable and shows that it's got staying power and doesn't need to go back to the markets to tap, you know, it doesn't not going to go bankrupt. I think the the stock of, of lemonade, the valuation, the market cap of, of we think the valuation of lemonade could uh, go up dramatically from here, way above you know where it is because now. Because the addressable market is huge. I mean, they can disrupt. Addressable market is huge. Yeah, yes. like like the same like cars, right? EV once it succeeds, sure. it can it can go anywhere. Now, two more yeah. questions before I leave you. Now, sure. now this. You know, uh, one thing which I kind of agree with you, Emmett, on, on the growth drivers, catalyst for Tesla, it's not going to be the insurance or energy business and all that. It's yeah. going to be within the EV evolution, right? Bought and yeah. I think, and, and probably Elon knows this. That's why it's gone this route, right? Uh, what's the reason why this energy? I, I know you've got a solar roof, right? I read about you getting yeah. a solar roof at your home. Why these businesses are not picking up? Is it a management issue? Is it the cons? Is it or because the addressable market for them is also huge, or is the focus issue? Um, I think what I've heard with the solar roof is they wanted to get the product down. They want first they want to get the tile down just right, the product, you know, and they had to do lots of iterations to get it per what they what Elon was happy with. He's like a perfectionist, I hear, in terms of yeah. you know, product architecture. And so that was took a long time. And and I think more recently you have the actual laborious manual labor installation of the solar roof has been trickier than um, they expected. You know, my roof took, you know, three, a little more than, I think more than three weeks to first take off the roof, took a few days, but then to put on the new, prep the roof and put on the new roof took like two weeks after that. Um, and so it took a lot longer than I think they initially planned. Like, I think they thought they could do it all within a few days or a week or something on each roof, but everything's taking a lot longer. And then hiring the teams of people or outsourcing it to different local roofing teams. It's just a lot messier of a process in my mind, I think, than they realize to be able to scale up quickly. You know, um, it's not like you can automate that. It's, it's just a lot of labor. Maybe that'll be a good use case for the Tesla bot in the future. If the Tesla bot can get up on roofs and do stuff, you know, I don't know, but I know they're continuously working to try to make it easier and easier for the roof installations. So it's just taken a long time. Um, the other things, insurance, they have to like get approval state by state Tesla energy, you know, the batteries, uh, whether it's the mega packs or, or the power walls, I think a lot of almost all the batteries they can, they can, they can get, they've given to, to build cars for as much as, you know, they don't want batteries to be the supply constraint for cars. So if chips become the supply constraint for cars, then they, all the excess batteries they can give to the power walls and energy storage stuff. You know, that's my, that's what I think they've done because it's, 
the, the, the batteries given in put, put into cars is a better use of battery in, you know, in terms of um, gross margins. And I think probably in, if I'm not sure, but if you did the math, maybe it's probably better on uh, carbon uh, capture or carbon, you know, carbon emission savings or whatever is if the battery is being used in cars for driving a lot versus a battery sitting in a power wall that doesn't get used a whole lot as much or something. So I don't know for sure on that last point, but that's just what, what I suspect. So that's why they've diverted as many batteries as they can to cars. And now when they have excess supply of batteries in the cars and the batteries isn't the limiting supply factor, then they can divert some of those battery capability or the battery supply more to storage, if that makes sense. That, and that, that cyber truck, I don't know when, when is that going to come? I mean, it's just getting delayed, delayed and delayed. Yeah, cyber truck. Uh, <laughs> I mean... <clears throat> That's going to, you know, he's saying by the end of this year, by the end of next year or sometime next year, they'll have their first deliveries. I believe that. I think, um, you know, they, they didn't, the demand for Cybertruck is crazy, but the demand for Model Y has been like endless. They can't meet the demand for Model Y. So if they're perfecting the Model Y production, they're getting 30% margins or 35% margins on the Model Y, especially with Giga Casting, they're getting it better. And there's so much demand. Why would they start a new product and not continue mm. getting that 35% margin of the Model Y, you know, why would they start a whole new product that's going to have negative margins in the beginning because it takes a while to ramp up, you know? Why would they do that when they can just continue diver diverting all their resources to making the Model Y and getting that 30 to 35% margins on it for as long as they can as it grows, you know? And what is it going to do with so much of money? So much of cash is coming in now. I mean, yeah. It's insane, right? Yeah, yeah, it's gonna, it's a cash cow. I think Wall Street's going to start realizing it. And uh, they're building factories. They can only build so many factory giga factories. I think they'll probably announce one in Canada is the rumor pretty soon and maybe somewhere else in, in Asia or something. So um, there'll probably be one in Brazil or something at some point or South America, I'm imagining. And, and um, you know, so I think uh, you can only deploy so much cash for building the new factories each factory is like four to 5 billion in total over a few years or something, I think is what the estimated cost is, but they're taking in more cash per quarter pretty soon and, or per year than they can deploy in factories. So they can't make, they can't, they don't want to build five factories. I want to be just, it's, it's just not an effective use of resources. It would be hard to do. And you have to get the supply chain up in, in time to be able to support the capacity of all those factories too. So it has to kind of all be in a big cadence. So I think they're going to have a huge excess supply of cash. And Elon alluded to, in I think the um, annual meeting, something, I think someone asked him and he said that, yeah, buybacks are on the table. Um, you know, share buybacks are on the table eventually. So I would suspect the share buybacks could happen in 2024. 2025, that kind of time range. That's my guess. You know, probably right. not 2023. And and just the, the, the just a closing thought, Emma. 2030. I know you said world's biggest company. What's the best case scenario in your mind, and what's the worst case scenario in your mind? Let's take in terms of market cap. For Tesla, for yeah. Tesla. I mean, I'm just shooting from the hip here. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, Matt's got the models. He number crunches it and spreadsheets and such, and he's done it. So my shooting from the hip uh, guesstimate from uh, studying it so much is Tesla. Best case is like a 20 trillion market cap company because the Tesla bot came online quicker and people are starting to widely accept the Tesla bot being like the next big thing that, you know, the world has ever seen, you know? Um, I don't think that would necessarily, I don't think that's likely to happen by 2030. I think it's more likely in the middle of the 2030s or something like where Tesla bot gets to that point. But I think it's possible that it accelerates, it's accelerated much faster than we think, we all think. And by the end of the 2020s, the Tesla bots, like in a lot of people's homes and all that stuff. Um, that's best case. I would say, you know, five to 15% chance, something like that. That's my just shoot from the hip number. Yeah, yeah. I say best case, and I'd say uh, worst case is um, you just have an onslaught of uh, people against Elon and against Tesla. You know, the U.S. government outlaws full self driving because taxi cab unions or legacy automakers that can't do it complain about it, even though it's statistically safer. There's outrage by Tesla fanatics, you know, and then China, you know, kicks Tesla out because of political tensions between Tesla, between the US and China. That would be terrible. That's the worst thing that could happen in the next few years, I'd say. So if all those things happen, 
I think Tesla could still produce very desirable product, electric vehicle cars with high gross margins, but they'll be, you know, that'll be their bread and butter um, for the whole decade, but to a lesser extent than, you know, if that those things didn't happen. So I think Tesla's still like a five trillion, five to ten trillion market cap company at that point by 2030, making, you know, between 10 and 30 EVs a year. 10, no, that's 10 not bad. Billion. It's five times from here now. Yeah. Even the worst 30. case is five times. Yeah, yeah. Worst case to me. And I think that's like a 10% chance, 10 to 20% chance in that in that range where I think the market cap would be just five times where it is. So now. the base case might come out to be 10 to 12 trillion, I would think. Yeah. I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe I don't know. This is not investment advice for anyone. No, 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 no. But, I'm just, but I'm I just... tell all my friends and family to put their, uh, you know, their long-term savings if they have a long-term savings in Tesla stock. I've said that for many years now. All right. Amor, that's it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. It was great to see you. You're in good health. And that yeah, you really too, happy. Rajiv. Yeah, thanks for interviewing me. I've seen a lot of good guests on your channel, and I'm glad to be uh, included in that. You're one of the first people that reached out to me after uh, being on those Dave Lee Lee uh, interviews. Um, so you have a special place, uh, you know, in my heart, and I'm happy to stay connected and help you get your channel going and so forth. Yeah. You give me some. Well, you have a special place in my heart as well because you came in. You didn't. You didn't bother. That is a new channel, old channel, established yeah. channel. No, it's a bit yeah. better than before, but you just came in. You just said yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, Andy. sure, sure. Yeah, I actually get a lot of people asking me now, and I have to turn down a lot of people. I just can't go on so many channels. So, I, yeah. you know, it's just uh, that's just the way it is. It's just, you know, it's just um, you. we all know that, that, that I guess the bit this business. You have, of, you have finite time and you have your things yeah. to do as well. And you run your own channel as well. I mean, and you're yeah. coming on Dave Lee, and I think there are a lot of appearance for you. But but thank you, Amit. And uh sure. And next year, I hope you're in the U.S. and then maybe I'll catch you. Yeah, sounds good. All right, that'd be cool. Come to San Francisco area. Yeah. yeah. All right, Take Rajiv. Care. Bye. 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 Bye.